James says, a great forest is set on fire by a small spark. A tongue is also a fire. We praise God with it, and then we're unkind to others with it. This should not be. I've got a plate now. I'm not getting a plate now. It's very dry, which I'll need shortly. But you know this, but your words are very powerful. You know, they can uh, have a big effect on people. They can certainly, you know, um, hurt people, bring tears to your eyes. Uh, if our words are unkind, words that are loving, words that are friendly, 
words that are cheerful, courteous, respectful, they're the words that build people up and build them up. And it's just too bad that sometimes our words are not always loving and kind. You know, when we make fun of other people, or we um, uh, call them names, or we're unkind, or tell them to shut up, or go away, you can't play with me, we don't like that, we don't like them. You know, those kinds of words are very hurtful for, for, for other people, uh, and very, very unkind. Um, in a minute, I hope I'm going to get a plate, because I think our words are a bit like this. They're a bit like toothpaste, and I'll tell you why, when Marion comes back, with a plate. I bought a plate this morning, got out of the car and dropped it. So <laughs> we're one plate less. I will tell you what that's all about when she comes back with a plate in a minute. And um, yeah, so we need to think very carefully about what we say when we speak to other people. Um, come back, Mario. Not as long as jolly good. I would like somebody, perhaps somebody young, to come and squirt some toothpaste onto a plate. Do that for me. Good, I'm glad you're here. Okay, not on me, as much as you like on that plate. I could have just squeezed. Mind the floor, mind my suit. A bit more, 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 a you have a job. <laughs> you can't get it back in the tube. And that's just like our words. Once they're out, that's it. You can't get them back in again. They're gone. They're, they're, they're out. People have heard them. So uh, words can make people happy, make people sad, or they can make people friendly and, and be with each other. If you speak kind words, you help others, you build them up, and you make them feel good. And there you go, use my words to say kind things. Hello, thank you, please, we're friends, and I like. So do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, says Paul in the Bible, but only what is helpful for building up others. Um, so just remember that. I'm sure you will. Good luck. Thanks for your help this morning. That was absolutely brilliant. I'm glad you're here today, which is absolutely great. Um, as we come now, um, I'm going to sing... Another song, which I'll just start off. There it is. Can I get that back to you, please? John, thank you very much. Uh, before the throne of God I stand, and after this, man's going to come and bring us God's reading and our prayers. <laughs> A strong and perfect plea, a great high priest whose name is love, whoever lives and pleads for me. My name is graven on his hands, my name is written on his heart. I know that while in heaven he stands, no time.
Christ my Savior and my God. Everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ is born of God. And everyone who loves the Father loves his child as well. This is how we know that we love the children of God, by loving God and carrying out his commands. This is love for God, to obey his commands, and his commands are not burdensome. For everyone born of God overcomes the world. This is the victory that has overcome the world, even our faith. Who is it that overcomes the world? Only he who believes that Jesus is the Son of God. This is the one who came by water and blood, Jesus Christ. He did not come by water only, but by water and blood. And it is the Spirit who testifies, because the Spirit is the truth. For there are, th for there are three that testify, the Spirit, the water, and the blood. And the three are in agreement. We accept man's testimony, but God's testimony is greater because it is the testimony of God, which he has given about his son. Anyone who believes in the son of God has this testimony in his heart. Anyone who does not believe God has made him out to be a liar because he has not believed the testimony God has given about his son. And this is the testimony. God has given us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. He who has the Son has life. He who does not have the Son does not have life. Now we enter into the final prayer. It's funny, when you get involved in schools, you go visiting schools, um, and those of you who are teachers will know this, Particularly younger children come out with all sorts of funny things when you see them, a little boy, and there he was drawing a picture. Okay, what's that going to be? Well, well, miss, and they always call me miss when I go to younger children. I've no idea why, but I'm always miss. And I go, well, miss, I'm drawing a picture of God. But hang on a minute, no one knows what God looks like. They will miss when I finished. <laughs> Used to be a, a proverb. And the proverb, um, simply this, hurt my child and you hurt me. And um, there were times when one or other of our three daughters, when they were younger in their teens, would lead us a merry dance. Times when we really didn't like them very much, not all at the same time, but now and again they do something silly. And, 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 but if anybody hurt them, watch out. Anyone who's doing things they shouldn't be doing, watch out. If you hurt the child, you hurt the parent. And in one John, that's the message that's coming across here that applies to the Heavenly Father. If you hurt the child of God, you hurt God. Simple as that. You can't say, I love God, if you hate his children. And this message is coming through one John quite a lot. You can't say, I love God, if you hate his children. Love's like an eternal triangle. There's God at the top. There's me, and there are the other children of God. And it's like an eternal triangle. God loves me, I love his children, his children love God, I love his children. It's a continual triangle that goes on. If you say you love God, that will be proved if you love his children. Everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ is born of God. And everyone who loves the Father loves his child as well. This is how we know we love the children of God, by loving God and carrying out his commands. Your love of God and your love for your fellow Christians and the Christian family are inseparable. They're one of the same thing. It's hard sometimes, I know, but that is what we're told here. That is what John is putting across here. Jesus to the questioning scribe said, there are two great commandments, he said. Love God with all your heart and soul and mind and love your neighbor as yourself. If you've been born of God, if you're a member of God's family, you not only have a heavenly father, you've got earthly brothers and sisters. 
in the Lord. And your relationship to them has evolved in your relationship to him. As a Christian, you love the Father whose family you've been born into. He's begotten you. And as a Christian, you love the other children whom God has begotten. It's inseparable. So the question is, who are the children of God? Who are they? Not everybody is a child of God. That's important, that's important for you to remember. Not everyone belongs to and is in the family of God. There are two kinds of family in the world, the children of God, the family of God, and the children of the world. What makes the difference? Everyone born of God overcomes the world. This is the victory that overcomes the world, even our faith. There's the answer. It's our faith, the key word. The children of God are those who have faith. Everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ is the Son of God, and that's what makes you a child of God, your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, John doesn't say that he who believes there is a God is a child of God. Faith in Jesus makes you a child of God. Believe in God, believe also in me, said Jesus. Believe in Jesus, put your faith in him, take him into your heart, be born again into the family of God, and the gates of heaven are open wide to you. A child of God, someone who believes that Jesus is the Christ. John doesn't say Jesus was, he says Jesus is. Julius Caesar was, but the believer says Jesus is. You believe if you say Jesus is, he's alive and you can't be a child of God unless you believe that. So, do we love the people who believe this? If you love the Son, you love the Father, the two things go together. And further proof is that you love God as you keep his commands. This came out very much in, in, in 1 John chapter 2. If you love God, you want to keep his commands. This is always close to John's thinking, obedience, the other proof of love. There's nothing to do with feelings. It is something practical. It's no coincidence that in the Ten Commandments, Five are to do with loving God, and five are to do with loving others. And John says to the one who loves God, the commandments are not burdensome, they're not irksome. A lot depends on whether you're half full, I guess, or half empty. The commandments are not burdensome, they're not irksome. So suppose if we've been married in mind here, suppose the first command of God is, you know, thou shalt have no other girls before me. Well, that's not irksome. That's not difficult. I don't want any other girls before marrying. It's not tough because I love her. That's the whole point. God says, you shall have no other gods before me is a command I want to keep, I try to keep, because I love God. When we love someone, no duty is too hard, no task is too great. There's a, a story about, um, uh, that is an old story, maybe I know this one, but this, this one day, this lad was on his way to school before the days when mum took the children to school by car. No transport, no cars, a long time ago. And the lad was carrying on his back a smaller boy. And the smaller boy was obviously lame, couldn't walk, disabled. And the stranger came up and said, and said to him, do you carry him to school every day? Yes, said the boy. Well, isn't that a heavy burden for you, said the stranger. Well, you see, it says, like, oh, he's no burden to the boy. He's my brother. And they carry him to school. People who say, I don't like the commandments. People who say they're out of date, they're negative, they, they spoil my fun, then don't love God. Because if you love God, you at least want to try and keep his commandments. When you love God, you want to live as he wants you to, to live by them. And they're there not to irritate, not to rough us up. They're there not to get you into heaven because you've got to keep them religiously. They're there because you're going to heaven and you want to please God in the way that you live. Who is it that overcomes the world? Only he who believes that Jesus is the Son of God. The world doesn't love God. The world doesn't keep his commandments. I don't know if you've heard of this person. This is Gypsy Smith. Gypsy Smith, um, Rodney, Rodney Gypsy Smith, MBE was a British evangelist and uh, he conducted campaigns in this country and campaigns in the United States of America for over 70 years. 
a long time, a very old man when he died. And people came in their thousands to listen to him preach. He was an early member of the Salvation Army. He was born a Romany in Epping Forest. If you go to Epping Forest, there is a, a commemorative stone to Gypsy Smith there still. Converted at 16 through his father, from listening to Ira Sankey singing, to visiting the house of John Bunyan. But he would say this in his sermons, a dead fish must go with the stream. It's only a live fish that can swim the other way. If you are spiritually dead, you go the way of the world without loving God, without and being mindful of his commandments. But if you are alive spiritually, if you are born to the family of God, you swim the other way. You swim in the wrong direction, not the right direction, if you like. You know? If we are Christians, we are swimming against the tide, whatever that means for you. God doesn't lay a commandment on you and then just lead you to it. With the vision, there comes the power. With the need, there comes the strength. God doesn't give his commandments and then go away and say, get on with it. What gives us the power to swim against the stream? It's our faith. This is the victory. It's overcome the world. Our faith. Who is it that overcomes the world? Only he who believes that Jesus is the Son of God. Because you've got your faith in him, that will carry you through to eternal life because you have his Holy Spirit within you. Faith, because God is at the head of the stream and not at the bottom. He is there by our side to enable us to carry out what he's commanded. And what is impossible with God, impossible for us rather, is possible with God. We have in our hearts, in our lives, his Holy Spirit. Our faith in Jesus. And is the Holy Spirit that gives us the power. You will be clothed with power from on high, said Jesus. You'll receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Those are promises which we can claim in Jesus' name and know his power within. What is the basis for our faith? Faith isn't based on something airy-fairy an airy sto fairy story. It's not based on legend or myth. It is based on fact, real life things. If something takes place and you're not there, how do you know it really happened? You know it really happened on the testimony of people who were there. You can find out the truth if you were not present at the event from people who are actually there. There are witnesses to the fact that Jesus was real. That he did the things he did, he said the things he said, that he died on a cross and he rose from the dead, because those things were written by the people who were there. And we have it in our scriptures written down for us. And if we believe that in Jesus, God entered our world and took our human life on himself. If we believe that, we believe that he cared enough for us to take upon himself the limitations of humanity and take upon himself our sin. And if we believe that, then this is an act of love which passes all understanding. And if we believe that, we believe that he shares in all those trials and temptations of human life that we have to face day by day. He's there with us in this business of you. Hallelujah. That's our faith. God cares. God shares. The world did its worst to Jesus. It hounded him. It slandered him. It judged him. It crucified him. It did everything possible to eliminate Jesus. And guess what? It failed. Hallelujah. Amazing. After the cross, there came the resurrection. And after the shame, there came the glory. This Jesus is with us by his spirit, who saw life at its brimmest, who died and conquered death, and who offers us a share in that victory. And if we believe, if we believe that Jesus is the son of God, we have with us always Christ the victor who could help us to be victorious. Hard sometimes, but he's there with us. John talks about water and blood in that reading. Because water's real, blood is real. They are both liquids in my body. They are there, they are real. When Jesus died on the cross, they pierced his side. What came out? Water and blood. 
And John is talking here about two witnesses, two witnesses, two events where God testified to his son, that his son was the Messiah, his baptism, water, and the cross, blood. Jesus was baptized by water, and what happened? Well, it sounded like thunder. A voice said, you are my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. God testified there were people who heard it. There were people who wrote it down and we got their testimony in scripture. Whose testimony are you going to believe? Those who say he's not the son of God, he's not divine, he's not the Christ, or God who says he is. And, it, and it's written down for us to read. And then the cross, we, we cannot be Christians without the cross. It's an essential part of, of what it's all about for us, all about Jesus. God's plan that God was in the death of Jesus as much as he was in the life of Jesus. But there's a third witness, the Spirit. Jesus was baptised in water and God testified, this is my son. And Jesus had another baptism to be baptised with. When Jesus came out of that water at that moment, he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove, lighting upon him, and then came that voice. This is my son whom I love, with him I am well pleased. John said in his letter, it is the Spirit who testifies, because the Spirit is the truth. There are three that testify. The spirit, the water, and the blood. And the three are in agreement. They testify to the Messiahship of Jesus. Seven weeks after that baptism of Jesus, seven weeks later, there was another baptism. This time Jesus was the baptizer. And this time people were baptized in the Holy Spirit. He said, for John baptized with water. But in a few days, you'll be baptized with the Holy Spirit. I wasn't there. At Jesus' baptism. And I wasn't there when he died. I wasn't there when he rose from the dead. I, I take these things on the testimony of others. But the baptism of the Spirit goes on today. Which is why John says the Spirit is the third witness. The filling or the baptizing of the Spirit was promised. It began at Pentecost. And it repeated itself over and over again in the history and experience of the church. Peter, on that wonderful first sermon he preached repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of jesus christ for the forgiveness of your sins and you will receive the gift of the holy spirit the promise the promise is for you and your children and for all who are far off all whom the lord our god will call the ongoing evidence of the spirit in the church was and is an undeniable witness to the continuing power of Jesus Christ, the Spirit, the water, the blood, three witnesses, all combined to demonstrate the perfect sonship, saviourhood, messiahship of the Lord Jesus Christ. How much more do we need who don't? There they are. John speaks of the person who believes in the Son of God. There is a wide, wide difference between believing and believing in a person. If you believe someone, you believe whatever statement they're making. Maybe. Yes, they tell the truth. Fine. If you believe in someone, then you accept the whole person and all that person stands for in complete trust. We would be prepared not just to trust that person's spoken word, also trust ourselves to that person, to him, to her. So to believe in Jesus is not simply to accept what he says is true. It is to commit ourselves into his hands for time and eternity because his spirit is in my heart. And this is the testimony. God has given us eternal life. And this life is in his son. He has the son. He who has the son has life. He who does not have the son does not life. It's very black and white, John. If you don't have the Son, you don't have life. And with this paragraph, the letter comes to a kind of an end. And what follows is a kind of postscript. The end is a statement that the essence of a Christian life leads to eternal life. 
the life of God himself. You know, it, it, it's easy to try and, and envisage heaven and eternal life from a kind of human point of view, because, you know, imagine, we imagine what eternal life might be like based on our, our experiences down here. Will I know so and so in heaven? What will I, you know, no, I mean, don't you? I think eternal life is going to be something quite different. In, in, in heaven, gosh, you know, a life of peace, because God's there. Life completely free from the fears and anxieties that we face down here. A life of power, because God in God there's power. A life completely free from sin and its consequences. A life where sin is defeated, because God is there and God is holy. A life where there is no bitterness, where there is no hatred, because in God there is pure love. A life which has the love of God at its heart. A life where there is no death, because God is life, and he gives us life. Where there is no illness, where there is no disability, where there is no pain. And I love that, that, that uh, verse. There's a couple of typing errors there, I apologise for that. Now the dwelling of God is with men, and he will live with them, and be their God, as men and women. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death, or mourning or crying, or pain, but the old order of things has passed away, and everything is going to be completely new, beyond our human imagining. I believe that Jesus is alive. I believe that he said things because of the evidence. I believe also because the spirit of Jesus is in my heart. Not just evidence outside, not just historical evidence, but evidence in here. Evidence that is, that is in my heart because spirit is in my heart and the spirit in me can connect with the spirit that is in you as well. An evidence of eternal life, of a new quality of life, something that death cannot take away. God himself will, is with us, will live with us, be our God, wipe away the tears from our eyes. No more death, no more mourning, no more pain, no more crime. The old order that we experience here, gone. And we come to John's concluding remarks that we didn't hear read to us. And he says, this is the confidence we have in approaching God. If we ask anything, anything according to his will, he'll hear us. The basis of prayer is the simple fact that God listens to our prayers. We need to believe that. It's hard sometimes. We need to believe that God listens to our prayers. We have confidence. And that word confidence means something like freedom of speech. We can bring anything to God. With God, we have freedom of speech. He's always listening, always more ready to listen than we are to pray. We never need to try and force ourselves into his presence. Sometimes it feels like that. Even the psalmist, why, O oh Lord, do you stand afar off? Why do you hide yourself? in times of trouble. We never need to compel him to pay attention. He's there, waiting for us, waiting for us to come and talk to him. But the point about prayer, John made this point, is it has to be according to his will. Is there a prayer that I cannot bring to God? Is there a prayer that's not according to his will? Well, we go to the temple, two men were there and they prayed. What was a Pharisee? A tax, and the other was a tax collector. And the Pharisee stood up and he prayed about himself, God, I thank you that I'm not like other men. Robbers, are evildoers, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. But the tax collector stood at a distance. He wouldn't even look up to him. In his presence said, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. And one prayer got as far as the temple ceiling, and the other prayer went straight to the throne room of the universe. And pray in the spirit on all occasions, says Paul. There it is, pray in the spirit. I have the spirit of God in my heart. Pray in the spirit. If you know the Lord Jesus Christ as Saviour, you have his Holy Spirit within you, you'll be praying prayers that are acceptable to God. You won't be praying that your lottery numbers will come up to see you. You'll be praying the things that God wants you to pray. 
according to his will. And the closer you come to Jesus, the more you will pray the right. Jesus teaches us to pray, thy will be done, not thy will be changed. Prayer is not asking God for what we want, it's asking God for what he wants. As we come to the end, there's a very difficult verse. Well, it's just difficult, I thought it anyway. You know, Mark Twain said, most people are bothered about those passages of scripture. They don't understand. He said, I've always noticed that the passages that bother me most are the ones I do understand. It's true, isn't it? But if anyone sees his brother commit a sin that does not lead to death, he should pray and God will give him life. There is a sin that leads to death. And that little verse has caused lots of, you know, arguments and discussions over the years. What does, what does he mean by that? You know, John's been praying about the Christian privilege of prayer, and he singles out those people, brothers and sisters, who need praying for. And maybe he's talking here about, about the person. And at this point, this, this speaks to me particularly. I always believe that if I'm going to preach a service, God talk to me first, or I don't preach it. The person who's caught up in a sinful desire, sinful action, that's become a compulsion, that becomes too strong to resist. And so eventually, that sin becomes easier, becomes part of that person. The regret for that sin becomes less and less. Doesn't matter, it's part of me. That sin can lead to death if it's not dealt with, not brought before our counsel of defence not brought before Jesus. Quite clearly, Paul says, the wages of sin is death. There you are, there you have it. If you want to make sure your sin doesn't lead to death, then you put your faith and your trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, who bore your sin on the cross, and you ask him into your heart, into your life, and you say, Jesus, I've sinned, forgive me. And you go to the council for the defence. You go to the advocate, to the best there is, and you plead on your behalf. I bore the punishment for Richard's sins. I've suffered in this place. As the psalmist said, as far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us, if we believe that, that Jesus carries our sins. You're never beyond the forgiveness of God. The wages of sin, yeah, is death, but, and there's a but, the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. And when John says in verse 18, we know that anyone born of God does not continue to sin, the one who was born of God keeps him safe, and the evil one cannot harm him. Doesn't mean we don't sin as Christians, of course we do. It means that the Christian is not the helpless slave of sin. If you're born into the family of God, Jesus keeps you. As someone once said, the Christian, you and I, we have an active enemy. And that's true. We also said, we have a watchful guardian. Even true. The Christian is not someone who never falls. The Christian is someone who, when they fall, when we fall, we get up. Every time we fall and we move on in the power of God's spirit. Because the one who was born of God, the Lord Jesus Christ, keeps you safe. As you go to him, who is the counsel for the defense. The Lord Jesus Christ keeps you safe as you go to him, who is the counsel for your defense. He will hold you fast. Amen. Robert Harkness, um, this is not part of the sermon, this is just a little introduction to the next song. Robert Harkness was a gifted pianist from Australia, and he traveled the world in his 20s with the evangelist R.A. Torrey, about 1905 or thereabouts. And there was one night at an evangelistic rally in Canada that Robert Harkness met a young man. And this young man had recently been converted. And the young man was fearful that he would not hold on to his heavenly found faith, his, his new heavenly faith. How can I hold on to it? And Robert Hartness, he was longed for this young man. And there were many others like him who became Christians at the meetings, longed for him to have that confidence, knowing that keeping their faith wasn't down to them alone, that God finishes what he starts. 
And Robert Harkness wanted a song. He wanted a song that would tell of God's hand in keeping our faith secure. And he mentioned this in a letter to a London hymn writer called Ada Havisham. Uh, she lived around 1861, 1918. And Ada Havisham then wrote several hymns, but including this one. When I fear my faith will fail, Christ will hold me fast. Robert Hartman's wrote the, the music for it, the original music. But it wasn't until about a century later that an American pastor in Washington, D.C., took Ada's words and wrote a new tune, the one that we sing today. Matt Merker, his name, and he's now the Director of Creative Resources and Training uh, for Getting Music. We're going to finish our service today singing that lovely hymn, I'm Not Believers Love. Just as high. 